On today's call, we bring in three expert attorneys to discuss the recent Supreme Court case on Booking.com and what that means for domain owners. Drew Rosner also joins us with his perspectives both as a domain investor and expert on domain name valuations and how the trademark ruling may affect that. Enjoy the show. FD was built by domain investors to increase your inquiries, sales, and profit. Forget spreadsheets and archived emails. Manage your entire investment portfolio in one place using a secure and completely confidential platform. Learn more at FT.com. That's E-F-T-Y, FT.com. <laughs> hey, Sherpa Network, I'm Tess Diaz, and thank you for joining us today for a show on Booking.com, the landmark Supreme Court decision. Joining us are three lawyers and Drew Rosner. Um, I'd like each of you to introduce yourself. Um, Stephen, you're top of my screen. Why don't you go first? Sure. Steve Lieberman, Law Office of the Greenberg and Lieberman. Uh, been in the domain industry for uh, sort of a couple of, couple of decades and more. Um, also, WileyFish.com. Everybody have to go, go and look at it. Um, we do intellectual property on a regular basis, as well as work within the domain industry. Thanks for being here today. Uh, Drew, you're next. Uh, I think most of the audience probably knows me, uh, but uh, yeah, Drew Rosner, CEO of Media Options, uh, as well as several other things. Not a lawyer, but a concerned investor. Not, not a lawyer, but I occasionally play one on Twitter. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but a very happy client of all three of these fine intellectual property attorneys. All right. Karen Bernstein, it's been a while. How you doing? We're surviving in New York. I'm an intellectual property attorney in, based out of New York City, but not really right now because of COVID. I'm in my summer home. Hope everybody is safe and well. Um, my firm's expanded. We have of counsel attorneys that also do corporate securities and also cannabis law, as well as patents. I've uh, been doing this since, well, 2001, but uh, the, the, the domainer uh, crowd, 2007, I'm very active with ICANN. Um, you know, I do UDRP and I go to court uh, occasionally and um, just love helping people. I always find it's a very great learning experience of being a lawyer and working with great clients. Super cool. Well, I always find it a great experience when I can meet up with you at a conference and have a drink. You're, you're always a fascinating person to talk to. So I'm <laughs> glad you're here. Uh, Zach Muscovich, hello. Hello, Tess. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, this is Zach Muscovich. I am a domain name lawyer. Uh, an IP lawyer and business lawyer. I've been practicing since 1999. And I'm also uh, the general counsel of the Internet Commerce Association. And thank you for all your service there. You put a and lot. Perhaps, perhaps the kindest Canadian I know. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. Um, so let's kick this off. Uh, Stephen, did you have some thoughts on framing this conversation? Sure. Um, well, everyone knows that the, that the Supreme Court made a decision and they basically said that because booking added on .com and that they were able to provide sufficient evidence, primarily survey, that the term booking.com could be trademarked and that it was not a generic uh, mark per se and it was recognized by the general community uh, for their particular goods and services. Um, this was a uh, decision that just came down and it's something that is gonna affect the domain industry based upon now people are probably, well, the, basically the discussion and why we're here is that now can anyone go ahead and obtain a trademark on a generic word by adding a TLD, you know, com, net, org, et cetera. Um, I guess one of the, my main points when I think about this is that it's all very well and good what the Supreme Court said um, from that point of view. And now it's going to be very much dependent on how the United States Patent and Trademark Office implements the decision. 
um, how they say wh what somebody has to do to, in order to show secondary meaning. The court did specifically state that they weren't saying that you had to do a survey, but the USPTO could, can, from an administrative point of view, say, all right, we're only going to accept moving uh, TLDs onto, you know, as not generics, based upon generic word and a TLD, um, if there is a survey. And they may not, we, 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 we just don't know. Yeah, I mean, so, they, do, they do have a manual procedure for examiners in the trademark office to file, and it's been longstanding policy at the US Trademark Office, what we call the PTO, that any extensions, TLDs, not be considered part of the mark, um, and that they were simply generic, like you would call something company or limited liability mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. Right, but they so, have to change that. Uh, I don't know, so, Without going too far into the weeds just yet, I, I wanted to sort of back up a little bit and, and, and sort of think about or talk about how we got here. So, you know, back in the day, we're talking, you know, mid, late 90s, you had, you know, hotels.com, you had cars.com, you had, you know, a variety of, of these super uber generic, um, you know, really premium dot com brands uh, that were developed on generic domains and subsequently received trademark protections. And then at what point did that change? At what point do, do we know, what, at what point did, was there, was there a specific case or how did we go from, some of those folks were able to get the, that trademark protection for a hotels.com type of thing. And then subsequently that was no longer, you know, on the table, right? So we are doing a deal right now, um, uh, well, I, I, it hasn't closed, so I, I can't mention it, but it's, uh, it, it's a completely generic term, uh, and the owner was able to actually obtain a, uh, a, a trademark um, for a fairly rudimentary website, to be honest with you, um, but he was able to demonstrate using commerce and obtain uh, three trademarks, in fact, one of which has subsequently expired um, in 2001, I believe. Um, and uh, these are domains that were registered, or the domain was registered at like 95, 96. Um, and, uh, you know, he, but he did subsequently get trademark protection and that trademark is now being sold with the domain. And it's interesting because they revalued the trademark after this, this decision came down. But um, uh, why were those folks able to obtain trademark protection? And then subsequently folks like booking.com were denied trademark protection uh, until, you know, obviously this, this uh, recent decision. Zach, um, I don't know. If yeah, you have, well, go ahead. yeah I, I think one of the important aspects of what the Supreme Court said in this decision is that there was nothing based on the USPTO's past practices or on trademark law that supported a general prohibition against registering a generic .com as a trademark. And in fact, the Supreme Court pointed out to at least a few examples of that having occurred in the past. They pointed out to art.com, uh, dating.com, both of which had obtained trademark uh, registration in connection with goods and services which were so closely connected to the generic meaning of the term. And so a lot of commentators are observing that that's been the practice of the USPTO in the past, although there hasn't been much consistency there, uh, but, but the practice should continue in the future for those very limited um, types of uh, marks that are generic dot coms, but have really proven, uh, as, as Stephen alluded to earlier, that the consumer consuming public identifies them with a particular source of goods. So I, I don't think anything has changed. I think that it uh, what what the Supreme Court ultimately did was stop the USPTO from from prohibiting. Uh, such registrations absolutely mm -hmm. going forward. So the status quo was maintained, arguably. Can I, can I just interject here? Yeah. There's another thing, and I'm not going to get too boring with it, but there's two types of trademark registers at the trademark office. There's something known as the supplemental register. I like to call it the ugly stepchild. Uh, the principal register. We we have uh, we have um, we have our trademark for uh, uh, right here. You can see it behind me. 
uh, domain names as a service is our trademark. Uh, and it, but they gave it, they won't give it to us on the primary register. We, we've got it on the, on the, uh, the secondary registrar, um, so, right. or supplementary so, or whatever, whatever it's called. Right. So the dating.com situations, you know, the, the thing is that it was originally refused by the trademark office as generic and dating.com was able to confuse, sorry, able to convince the trademark office that it belonged on the supplemental. So even though they have a trademark registration, it's on the supplemental registration. If the audience out there has seen domain name disputes where complainants use generic.coms or whatever's CLD, mm -hmm. and the respondent argues, well, you're on the supplemental register, it's a legal admission that your trademark's weak. So it means that really you don't have a lot of exclusive rights to that trademark. Sure, you can put the R with the circle around it, but the reality is if you want to start showing when you first use a mark, which first to use in the States is rather than first to file, you have to do a whole dog and pony show. Whereas if you're on the principal register, your certificate of registration automatically proves your first use date. So, I, I mean, that's, that's absolutely, absolutely right for dating.com. What's interesting is that art.com is on the, is on the principal register. Um, uh, weather.com on the principal register. Mm. Well, I think that the, what I saw, because I've been, I'm sure we've all been looking at this, but the, I'm looking at my notes because I'm doing some stuff here, but uh, art.com uh, was determined, let me see here, <laughs> one second. Um, it had, it got a registration for online retail store services mail order catalog services and catalog ordering services all featuring note cards, signs, plaques, magnets, mirrors, calendars, photo frames, and t-shirts. Um, computerized custom framing of artwork. So a lot of the stuff was, was really services. It wasn't mm -hmm. like they were actually, and they, they'd been using the mark for more than five years, which doesn't always save the day, and that's for another discussion. But the ridiculousness about it is that they were serving, they, their computer as custom framing of artwork had to do with art, but it wasn't like they were actually selling products, like actual art. <laughs> so right. I think that's kind of how they got away with it. But I think at the time, the uh, trademark office was maybe, you know, it always depends on the examiner, uh, mm -hmm. just said, hey, five years or more, that's, that's good enough for me that it shows that it acquired distinctiveness. But let me go back to the supplemental register. When you claim acquired distinctiveness uh, in a trademark, what we call 2F, you're also admitting that your mark is weak. So it is not the same thing as getting a trademark on the principal register as you know on the spectrum of trademarks. It is the weakest type of trademark that you can get. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it starts out weakest, but I mean, frankly, over time, if you use it and the, the public actually learns to believe that it, that that mark represents your company, it can be just as strong as any other mark. True, um, but, but remember, you don't want to cut out competitors when you have a generic mark, and that's always the tenu tenuous true. push pull of what, it. what do you mean by that? You don't want to cut out competitors. Go ahead, Stephen. No, you go ahead. You okay. said it. So if you get art.com and someone has artbook.com or artthis.com and you take your trademark registration and you try to bully your competitors into not competing with you, what trademark law is trying to do with generic names is to prevent undue competition, unfair competition by giving a monopoly to one party or the other, which is the big concern for domainers which is the trademark holder has some sort of dot .com or dot .whatever with a generic name and they go after not only trademark, uh, not only domain name holders, but also their own competitors. I have a case right now, I can't tell you, where they're using two words that are clearly generic. And the sole purpose of them trying to get the trademark is trying to knock my client out of the market. So mm -hmm. that's the point, you, you wanna prevent people from saying, well, I own apple.com for apples. So I'm gonna go for after every single person who uses the word apple. In fact, I think it was Ginsburg, right guys? That said that 
booking.com case doesn't prevent someone from calling themselves booking or not mm -hmm. calling themselves, but saying, you know, using the term booking. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? That's it's right. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and that, that's that been the law of trademarks since day one, that you're right, that, that uh, uh, no matter how much money you pour into promoting a generic term, it can never become distinctive of a particular party, right? So that's why booking, the word can't ever be trademarked uh, for booking uh, services. But, right. you know, I, she, but uh, the majority for Justice Ginsburg pointed out that, that it's um, a different story when it, when it comes to adding the dot .com uh, because that, that can or is capable in some circumstances of uh, having consumers identify with a particular service. I mean, one, one um, uh, kind of uh, one thing that um, one of Booking.com's lawyers said recently, which I found interesting, which was uh, David Bernstein is also a UDRP panelist. And no relation. A, <laughs> yeah, no relation. That's I right. <laughs> yeah. So he's also a well-known UDRP panelist and, and uh, IP expert. And he was one of the lead counsel uh, for Booking.com, although he didn't argue the case himself in the court. That was left to another attorney. He said that what the Supreme Court decision is confirmed what millions of Americans already know, uh, which is that Booking.com is a particular business. And so when you hear Booking.com, you don't think of it as a generic general source for bookings of some kind. You, you, you know that it's the company. Millions of Americans know that through, you know, having them process millions of travel bookings and spent billions of advertising, et cetera. So in that sense, it's, it's a kind of a common sense decision. It, it definitely is. That's the, they looked at the whole point of view for, as a common sense point of view, not from sort of the legalese, but it puts us in somewhat of a quandary pertaining to what is confusingly similar in this case. Up until yeah, so now, think... confusion has been and all right, you know, it's roughly the same word. You're in the same goods and services. You really can't do that now anymore because what if booking.com, and I know they said they weren't going to do it in the Supreme Court, but what if they'd want it when, went after booking.net? Is that confusingly similar? And I'd say, honestly, it is. Well, you know, booking.com owns all of these domain names. I was just looking it up for the heck of it. They own everything from .org to but it's true. I'm sure there's a TLD the they don't is, have. Yeah, and the question is, would no, they have a right to it, right? So that that's really, I, I, I guess, you know, look, this is Domain Sherpa. Our audience is primarily uh, two things. You know, let's say probably 70, 80% are domain investors. Uh, then you've got some sort of online marketing, and then you've got some people that are corporate domain managers, right? And so uh, from the perspective of domain holders, right, uh, how does that apply, right? Like, so you've got, let's say booking.com doesn't own booking.net and I've got booking.net and now booking.com has just, you know, submitted their arguments to the Supreme Court saying that we're not going to go out and, uh, you know, chase down ebooking.com and hotelbooking.com and we're not going to go do that. Uh, but, you know, as, as um, uh, 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 some other attorneys have pointed out, uh, that doesn't really mean shit to a tree they can do as they please. Um, now, that may come up in a, you know, an opposing counsel would obviously bring that out and say, well, you said you weren't gonna go do that, but I don't know that that has any legal basis whatsoever. So the question is, where do, where, where and obviously this is gonna come down to case law, right? So, so we're gonna have to start building that case law, but what, what do you think? What is your thoughts around, you know, our rights as a domain owner? So, so you know, on the surface, for months leading up to this decision, and I apologize for the tangent, but um, leading up to this decision for months, you know, I was really, really watching this case and I was, I, I watched it, I watched the, uh, not all of it, but most of it, you know, with the live feed, um, it, it was really intriguing. And, um, I, you know, I, I was rooting for this decision. This is the decision that I wanted, right? And, and in my mind, it was the decision, it, it was the right decision because as Zach, I believe correctly pointed out, um, I think it maintains the status quo. And, um, but it does, as I think Stephen points out, it introduces a whole new level of complexity. And so, so as you know, a domain owner, where, where do we stand? Where, where, what happens now? You know what, I, I'm sure all, all three of us have uh, good answers to that question. So let, let me, 
uh, go uh, give my yeah, own I'd love to get, perspective I want on everybody's it. opinion yeah. for sure. So, so a few points. First is that um, what was what's been clear in trademark law and what was clear from the decision itself, and, and as Karen mentioned, is that these uh, kind of generic.com trademarks have the absolute narrowest scope of protection of all trademarks. So on, the, on the spectrum where you have you know, a made up term compared to a generic term, this one, the made up term gets the greatest kind of uh, scope of protection. This one gets the absolute least. That's a general principle. It hasn't changed and, was, and the court reminded us of it in the decision, point number one. Two, interestingly, uh, in 2011, Booking.com got an EU trademark for Booking.com. And in 2017, they brought the only UDRP using the Booking.com trademark that they had obtained in Europe. The only one they brought. It was for Booking.com.xyz. Okay, and you could see why they brought that UDRP, right? It, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, I think it's interesting that's the only one they brought when they could have tried to bring other ones. So mm -hmm. that's an indicator of, of not what might happen in the future, but of how things have happened in the past, and it might be an indication of how things happen in the future. Mm -hmm. Third, if, if we apply this, the, applicable, the right test, which is to give them the absolute narrowest scope of protection and also continue to allow users to use the word of the English language, booking, <laughs> uh, to describe what they're providing, my, my view is that the proper application, whether it's courts or UDRP, would, would prevent booking.com from obtaining even uh, 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 anything other than perhaps uh, typos of booking.com. I think they would get that. I think they would be able to use their trademark if someone started for some reason uh, spoofing their website and putting a fake booking.com logo on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, beyond that, I think they'd have a very tough time. But if there is one aspect of this decision that does cause me some apprehension, it's that people, uh, trademark owners and their counsel, will mis, uh, misunderstand this decision and believe yes. that it gives them the right to try to overreach and get more when that's not what the decision says. And it's going to be up to you know, experienced IP attorneys like Karen and Stephen and myself to push back against that effort because this did not open the floodgates for grabbing domain names. It gave a very, very limited remit. And uh, Professor uh, Rebecca Tushman of Harvard, who filed an amicus brief in this court and is very active and knowledgeable in uh, the academic study of UDRPs and, and, and at ICANN, she made the really important observation. She asked the question, is the game worth the candle? And But what she meant by that is that if, and this is a kind of a phrase, I had to look it up myself, but what it means is that back in the day, you're playing a game by candlelight, and, the, and if you're going to waste a whole candle, the game better be good, right? Yeah. And so, so what she was saying is that if, if Booking.com gets such limited trademark rights, is it really worth them having trademark rights in the first place? And, because what can they really use it for? And so that's the question that we're going to have to keep an eye out for, because in my view, they didn't really get very much, if anything. And so but will other parties or even they try to make something out of this? Yeah, I'm going to agree with you and disagree with you on, on some things. I, and I think the candle part's actually the most interesting, but I'm going to jump back. You said you thought typos would be something that they can actually get. And I question that because just – if the typo is doing the same thing but not using any of their other other intellectual property i think they could the typo could argue wait it's different you have a very narrow trademark and 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 there's no basis here for you to be able to stop us from doing the exact same thing you're you're doing i mean for instance booking b o o o o o k i n g something like that it's not the same mark, and um, it, I, I think they would have a hard time in that case. Um, the candle part's actually fascinating, and I actually spoke to a friend of mine who does valuations in other areas of intellectual property, and I've done a little bit of that myself. And one of the th things that he suggested was that the point of obtaining the trademark was not really to be able to enforce it, but was to be able to obtain a higher valuation on their company. Interesting. Um, 
So it's more more being a financial yeah. sort of thing. Well, look, look at Andrew's to... uh, eyes light up. <laughs> the, the gears are turning. The gears are well, turning. <laughs> I, I, I mean, so I, you know, let me, let me I, I want to hear Karen's points on this. Yeah, yeah. But I, but let me just reflect on that for one second because you're right. I, my eyes light up when I hear that because <laughs> so in my mind, you know, I'm looking at this not just as a domain investor but as a domain broker, and I can tell you unequivocally that the greatest hurdle to well, well, one of let's say two or three of the greatest hurdles that I face in my daily you know, uh, uh, the discussion, negotiation, and, and sales tactics of selling high value domain names, which are typically very generic domain names, some being used in generic fashion, some being used, you know, in a non-generic way, Apple to sell computers, for example, right? So um, for me, and the reason I supported this decision, you know, from the get-go was that um, I believe that if this decision had gone the other way, it would have inherently change the startup nomenclature. So startups who are thinking about how to name their company, Fortune 500 is thinking about how to name their next product or service. Instead of going with an Apple or an Amazon, they go with a Yahoo or a Google. And so um, that was my fear. And if that's the case, then this massive wave that we've seen of generic domain names being used for um, uh, startup naming, I believe that that trend would have come to a halt. And so um, when you tell me that Booking.com's objective in this case was not to create defensible rights, but to improve their balance sheet, I, I, I understand that. That makes sense to me. And, um, and I think that that's actually exciting because I think that that, again, supports the idea that this decision will um, perpetuate the nomenclature, the, the existing nomenclature that I'm seeing in startups, VCs, and you know, Fortune 500 launching new products and services. Right. If you're going to get a generic .com or a generic TLD, you know, it's definitely an asset builder. It's another way to sell a domain name too. You know, mm -hmm. hey, the category killer. This is nothing new to get a category killer domain name. I mean, yeah. everyone wants a category killer domain name. Yeah. But I do believe that there are. When you get to the level of a booking.com, you're, you know, you've got uh, IP attorneys, and I'm not saying I'm one of them, that's going to find ways to protect that mark because part of owning a trademark, like owning a property, is you want to be able to keep people out. <laughs> and well, what a weird, what a weird situation these guys are in. They have to sort of navigate between not overreaching and still their obligation of protecting their mark, right? They I don't out think there's much the protecting their mark. They'll go after little guys. They'll threaten people. Yeah. You know, yeah. if somebody, if they're going to go after, you know, well, well, uh, deep pockets that are going to fight them, it might be just in order to extract some sort of settlement and money will be exchanged. It happens every single day of the year. But I think it's a great uh, selling point, another tool say I agree. For brokers to sell domain names to especially I, like you said 100%. to start you know, you know what the greatest thing about the, the decision to me has nothing to do with the law itself per se it's that the supreme court of the united states is talking about generic.com domain names that yeah. blows me away amazing. it blows me away right. you know <laughs> right mic drop amazing yeah. i agree can, yeah. I, 100%. can i just throw in a monkey wrench here yeah. um interesting discussion uh, uh I will credit Doug Eisenberg, uh, who you may or may not know, who's a panelist. I don't know, he's a WIPO or the forum. And he has a blog called Giggle Law. You're welcome, Michael. I mean, Doug. Um, in there, he points out there is a discussion in the, in the opinion that they are not, I forget the, the term that they use, but we call them domain hacks, okay? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so the decision was very, very clear to point out that this decision has nothing to do with domain hacks. So mm -hmm. if you want to call yourself, I forget, give me a good domain. It, I think it, I so think the example was. House. So we own greenhouse.com. Uh, 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 what was the green example? Dot house. Tennis .net, I think. Was it? That's hard. Ah, good. They, That's a great one. You might recall a million years ago, I wrote an article on projectmeet.me. Full right, disclosure right. from .me's general counsel. That's beside the point. Anyway, Project Me 
they read the entire domain name together with the TLD. And at, at the time, I think it was 2008, it was such a big deal because nobody did that. So I thought it was interesting that, that the Supreme Court said, this doesn't have anything to do with these types of, I forget what the term was, but we call them hacks. I, you know, th I mean, th this should probably be reserved for an entirely other domain chirp episode, but it is such a fascinating topic. But like, you know, I feel like, and, and you guys know better than I do, but I feel like that's a contradicting opinion, right? How can you say that adding .com to the end of the word booking has created a distinctive brand, but yet not apply, the, apply that same logic to a domain hack, which, you know, in my opinion, and I would assume the opinion of everybody, creates an even more distinctive brand, right? Here's a funny um, one for you. Wait, here's a funny one for you. So there was an application in the trademark office for Anna, A-N-I dot me, anime. And guess what the uh, website is about? <laughs> and it's a wonderful website, by the way. I just visited it. It's gorgeous. It's all about anime. And they refused registration based on genericness, and they didn't have the money to try and talk their way out of it. it it's, that's, Did they I, try to argue that, that, that the consuming public recognized there it was like being a dead dead and arrival they they got the yeah. they didn't do anything but it's a wonderful yeah. website <laughs> it's a really cool website you know we were talking earlier about you know what the steven raised this you know what is the trademarks office going to do from here on in when people start applying or or you know actually doug eisenberg also says he doesn't expect to see a uh, a significant number of of new generic.com trademark applications or a significant number of uh, new uh, UDRP cases involving generic.com. You also mentioned that, but but what will the USPTO do? I, I, you know, we don't know. I have a couple thoughts on it. One is that, you know, recognizing that this is the organization, the institution that, that tried to prohibit, you know, across the board generic.com registrations, they may not switch gears so easily. They may be like, no, it's going to be very, we're going to keep it tough. I know what the Supreme Court said, but we're going to keep it really tough. Um, uh, the second thing is is that I think that that survey evidence, uh, although is not determinative in and of itself, and the Supreme Court said care must be taken with it, and there's real problems with a lot of it, as Karen yeah. mentioned. I think that w if the if the crucial part of the Supreme Court test is consumer identification, really it's going to be uh, tough to to prove consumer identification of a particular brand without without survey evidence. Yes, you can go to media reports and dictionary uses and magazines and other internet sites and stuff, but at the end of the day, if you have to say that the consuming public knows that Booking.com is a particular company, without a 50-state survey, uh, I, I think you're going to have a real tough Well, time. I mean, do they have to do yeah. a 50-state yeah. survey or do they just yeah. have to do a sufficiently large enough yeah. survey across the internet that's going to let them be, may reasonably argue that the consuming public actually knows because you always go to the question of who is the actual consuming public yeah. um, mm -hmm. we've seen surveys lots of time and if you you couch a survey with it uh, with the wrong questions or send off the questions to the wrong people it becomes essentially worthless and you spend um, gobs and gobs of money on these survey experts and, and like you're saying Stephen, you know are they going to be, is the trademark office going to be judge and jury to determine that this particular method of survey, of methodology, of the survey is reliable? I well, they've always been a, the judge and jury, a, at least at the initial stage. If you don't like it, then you file an appeal. Right. Um, you have a lot of money to fight that. I mean, that's my point. The average person or company. Right. Well, then let me give you a different question. Does that mean that this is really only usable? by those entities that have a lot of money? Is this I made think, almost okay. a... I uh, guess so oh. for good reason, but for good reason, yes. A, it takes a lot of money to actually pay for the surveys and for the lawyers to prosecute this all the way through. But, but the, the good reason really is that only the largest companies that spend the most money will be able to, to have that consumer I don't agree with you on that. Which is what exactly about, right. Hold, hold wait, on, wait, wait. Hold on. Zach's making the most important point because it, it, as far as I'm concerned, because it's exactly that. The, you okay. only can obtain that distinctiveness by spending freaking billions of dollars to, to, um, to make the whole What about these Twitter company and not just a, you know, some 
you know, I, I don't even know what people think, but people are pretty stupid. So people believe that, you know, uh, uh, if booking.com popped up tomorrow, people would think like, oh, it's some, uh, you know, it's just a part of the internet. Like, they don't really get, I don't know, people, don't, it wouldn't be necessarily perceived as distinctive. This is a company, this is a brand. It would just be like, oh, it's this. Traffic, internet traffic and social media would be enough to put you over the hump for a generic TLD. Well, what, that, what's the hump, I guess, right? The, like, so this yeah, is, but the, there's no definition of what the hump is. It's exactly. what is the consuming public. There's some of these Twitter things where you got millions of people looking at them and people put their .com domain on it. And maybe if it were generic and somebody didn't have a lot of money, and, but the consuming public may actually recognize it, they wouldn't have the, the money to actually do the litigation in order to get it all the way through. That doesn't here, seem all that fair either. Well, here in the States, there's apartments.com. I'm not going to be surprised if they file, if they try to make the same argument as booking.com. They run so many ads all day long. That takes a lot of money. And you're saying to me that a social media like Twitter, I don't know. I, I, I guess it, it's so subjective and you never know what the trademark office or a court may buy. But I think that they really look like the UDRB panels to substantial expenses, profits, you know, all of these different factors to, to get to that point. And we all know as trademark practitioners that booking.com was just another one of those cases that said survey evidence worked here. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree with you. And that is what happens. But I'm questioning whether that's really the right thing, whether that's correct, because the internet has changed the way things uh, happen enormously over the last couple of decades. This, this, this was going to be. Go ahead. I, 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 would, I would say that that uh, Stephen's point uh, that uh, social media usage uh, can contribute to the argument that um, the public is aware of a particular brand. But at, at the end of the day, I think to to cut to connect the dots of. The public is aware of the existence of a brand, but identifying it with a particular company, you probably need the survey evidence to close that circuit. But not, not uh, the, the court very clearly said that survey evidence is not the only source. Uh, you can I go to other sources, but without it, you're going to have a tough time. But I like Stephen's point because I, it would be interesting if there was an incredible you know, amount of followers on a Twitter account or social media in general to be able to make the argument in a survey that they identify it. Um, and of course it doesn't cost a lot of money to do that. So I, I, I say that's a very cool idea. I'd like to see that happen sometime. I, you know, I, I'm so fascinated. I mean, deep at heart, I'm an anarchist and, and an extremist. Uh, uh, but I, I look at this and I, I, deep down, I have to say that I think there's this potential for this case to blow up the entire trademark law as it applies to the internet because I, I, I there is such a wide scope of potential outcomes here like if i have the twitter account you know that's uh, uh twitter.com slash booking uh and i've got you know 15 million followers and uh you know i'm referring people to bookings on twitter right now i uh, can i now contest that like like or, or let's say I have a Twitter account that says Booking.com, whatever, for whatever reason. My, my company was called Booking.com because we do booking, you know, communications, you know, hotel booking communication. Uh, now what, right? What, what? I don't know. I mean, well, that's the point. We don't there, know what's so going to happen. Divisions. There's so many divisions of the Internet. You know, you've got the domain names. You've got social media handles. You've got, um, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I, there's, there's, you know, you've got all yeah. these new, these new, you know, root systems being developed, right? Like you've got these decentralized internets being created, um, yeah. you know, from unstoppable domains to uh, handshake and, and name based, you know, you, you've got a variety and there's others. Uh, how do you enforce a trademark like that? Uh, well, I mean, there's three angles here. How do you enforce it? How do you even, how, how can you grant it? And then, you know, uh, can there be multiple? Like, like you know, uh, I don't know. It, it's such a strange, 
Uh, yeah, you know what? You know what's interesting, Andrew, is that over the years, and you know, Karen and Stephen have probably noticed this in their respective practices, as have I, is that the social media handles has become an increasingly important part of the IP, right? And but we have, totally. you know, co we have court and we have UDRP to deal with domain names, but when it comes to trying to get a, a handle back from a, a platform, they have their own internal opaque, you know, uncertain rules and you never know how it's going to come out. So, I mean, we may start seeing more procedures for the handle aspect. And, and do they have but, any obligation? Because they own what? it, right? You, what, you don't what? own it. You, as yeah. the registrant of a social media handle, yeah. you don't have any ownership, yeah. right? I mean, this is the, the, this is the whole cancel culture, right? This is, this is at the root of cancel culture is, you know, not your handle, not, you know, uh, uh, not your platform, not your handle, uh, uh, you know, yeah, so, yeah, a lot of them say you're not even allowed to transfer it, even though we both we all know your people transfer them for substantial money on a regular basis. Yep. Um, I, I I'm really curious if anyone has ever done a valuation on a company and taken into account the social media handle and its traffic, absolutely, and whether that has increased the value of the company, even though they can't technically sell it. I invested. I invested into uh, Weed Club, uh, which is farmhouse. Um, uh, One of my buds. And yeah, and uh, Weed Club, and um, uh, actually quite a few domain investors are are among the uh, loyal share shareholders of that company. Um, and you know, he he owns the Twitter handle at four twenty, yeah, and, and that is absolutely a very significant portion of the valuation of that company. A significant yeah. portion. Yeah. At least it was at the original valuation. So do you think you could get uh, at 420 or 420.com as a... Oh, you know what? This is actually brilliant. So uh, uh, let, let, let me do a quick search because he sent it to me. They actually, I don't know if this is, you know, they precedent setting. Five times. It's he obtained, he obtained a U.S. trademark for at 420. I swear <laughs> to you. And there is a 420.com trademark as well. Yeah, Evan, um, Evan, Evan Horowitz? Hmm? Yes. Uh, so Evan wrote to me, uh, the federal trademark application for at 420 mark has passed examination and was not opposed during the relevant opposition period. The next step is registration, which we anticipate will occur within the next one to two months. Um, well, we're good services. Is, yeah, that's hold on. That's I so it's literally at 420. All right, let me show you the. There's a million right. 20 trademarks, by the way. Uh, I probably shouldn't even. I'm not going to bother because you might see some stuff that I shouldn't share. Is that AT uh, is, or the at sign? Hold on, hold on. Arranging and conducting that's business crazy. conferences, arranging and conducting business networking events, organizing and providing business events for entrepreneurs, arranging and conducting business competitions for entrepreneurs. To compete for financing. Yeah. Um, and I know. So, yeah, um, I mean, look, that. Whoop. The thing is, oh, though, was that file that's does, significant? Did they prove use yet of the mark? Did they do it on a use basis? Yeah. 2015, first use in commerce. And mark was granted December 19. Interesting. Because it seems to me like that would be. They would see it would have to do with cannabis. Interesting. Very interesting. I, I got a question for you guys. I'd love to hear your opinion on it. So uh, just switch gears slightly, but it relates to, the, to uh, Andrew's original question is that, so, you know, I can keeps coming out with all these new GTLDs, right? I think there's like 2,500 have been approved. They're have, going to have a second round of dot so everything many. under the sun, so many. And so, I mean, Ostensibly, the uh, the use case presented by ICANN for issuing all these new GTLDs is that this provides more opportunities for people to register domain names because dot coms are already taken, etc. So, I mean, what, but what what happened? Like, if Booking dot com were to go out, uh, be able to go after Booking dot cat, Booking dot horse, well, not dot cat. That's a you know CCTLD for Catalonia in Andrew's home country, right? <laughs> but No, I'm in but, Portugal, not Spain. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're in Portugal next to it. That's right, that's right. Uh, but so, so you know, it, it's interesting because they're, they keep on giving these out. And But at the end of the day, is, can a, a user really register, as, as Stephen said, book, booking.net 
or booking that, this and that. I, I would have to say, I'd be curious to hear what you guys think about it. I'd have to say that, that their trademark isn't booking, it's booking.com and they're stuck with Absolutely. it together. And so they can't get booking.ca, they can't get booking.fish uh, uh, because well, dot com, because small differences travel? matter. Small differences matter. Booking dot what? Dot travel. Booking dot travel. I don't think they would be able to get that too because uh, booking travels a, is a common phrase, and their their trademarks limit to booking dot com, and they're stuck yeah. with it. Um, so, well, I mean, I when really, you do a filing for when you do a filing for a trademark, and you put in your um, uh, sample of use, and if it's not substantially the same, the uh, your use of it, then it's that sample is not accepted. Um, and I would argue that you're right, Zach, that, 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 you know, dot travel, dot anything else that would not work, that they have to put booking.com always on their, all their, as their use for the company and as use of the mark. No question about it. I agree. Yeah. Me too. So, well, so, so just so, just so there's more clarity, even for the, the viewers watching, suppose we added an, another word before the booking.com. Suppose we mm -hmm. added like, travelbooking.com, hotelbooking.com, uh, portugalhotelbooking.com. What about situations like that? They, they, that too would be different because it's not really, I, I mean, as Karen said, this is a very narrow mark. And if you add on that additional word, well, it's I'll, not I'll the same to mark. Be it is to be correct, it's not a mark yet. So, uh, no, no, you're right. They right, haven't. The, the, the mark has not been granted. The mark. Yeah, no, 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 no. A mar, a, you're talking about a registration. I mean, it, okay. Remember, okay. registration doesn't give you a heck of a lot more than you already had beforehand. All of your rights and trademarks come from common law, come from your actual use in commerce. In the okay. United States. But I do, I do think that if it was like, whatever your example is, blah, blah, booking.com, oh, I think yeah. you could make a reasonable argument that it's confusingly similar. Because it's well, part of the mark. But then everything's and confusingly the, similar. Well, but then that's my point about the, this, this whole the case left. blowing up trademark law. Because the left. Well, then, you know, where I, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's like either this mark has absolutely no merit, right? Uh, in which case they're not entitled to any of that stuff we're talking about. Uh, or they are, right? So what's the point of issuing the mark if they're not entitled to really any protections? Now, I guess it does apply in the sense of, uh, I think Zach pointed out, like, like somebody spoofing their website and using booking.com on the website, right? Or, um, you know, uh, I, typos is probably in a, a more gray area. Spoofing is probably more directly correlated. Um, and, and I would imagine that would give them some, some protections in that area. But, you know, it's real, the part for me, and, and I think for most domain investors, that, that is going to be most interesting to see is how is this applied in terms of the dot net the dot org the dot whatever right and and it, it you know how is it going to be interpreted and used by by the you know the panels and the trademark office um and the risk that the domain investors willing to make in investing in that generic dot net or other tld but yeah. i do think that we have pretty much derived based on steven's uh, interpretation and I agree is that or was it Zach I can't remember which guy but the fact of the matter is booking.com is their trademark so for a domain investor to be looking at booking.nv or booking. of course trademarks are country by country but let's say with a GTLD booking.pizza booking. you know whatever there's out there they're gonna have a very difficult time they're not gonna be interested probably in obtaining those domain names. I don't, don't, don't see, you know, but if it was booking.com.pizza or booking.com.whatever. Well, let me, yeah. let me well, ask you a question. Left of um, the they, they will have rights. That's one of the examples I always give to clients is I say, you know, imagine your mark up on a uh, banner in a, on, on a street and then imagine the other, the registration uh, right next door and they're selling the same, have the same goods and services. Now, imagine the 
general consuming public, let's imagine you were the general consuming public, and you're walking by, and would you think the two stores were related? So let's do that with this. We'll have booking.com up on a sign, and right next door we'll have booking.com.au. Would you think that would be the consuming public would be confused, and I guess we have to walk by on the internet since the consuming public is only on the internet, but still, would they actually be confused and think that they were the same company? I, I would argue yes. <laughs> yes. I think to I the agree. left of the dot that booking.com is going to have more of an advantage. If it was portugalbooking.nv, I'm making this up, or it was portugalbooking.com.nv, then I think they would have a case there because it's still mm -hmm. the left of the dot. Right. So here, here's, here's an interesting little anecdote. Um, booking.com does in fact own uh, booking.com with one O, right? So double letter is usually the most common typo, right? The most common typo of Google is G-O-G-L-E. Um, they, so they do in fact own that typo, which is probably the most common typo. Um, they do not, in fact, own bookingcom.com. So, and it, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a definitely owned by a domain investor. Um, <laughs> what, how does that apply? Bookingcom.com, right? They should, that, yeah, when did they register the domain name? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Looking for the defense. The question? Yeah. 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 But you know, this is a priority. Out, out yeah. I think booking bookingcom.com is really close to that UDRP that I mentioned to you, which was bookingcom.xyz, where the domain was transferred and arguably rightfully so. And so, you know, look let's look, take a quick look at what the Supreme Court said about uh, these kinds of going on there, Andrew. Okay. Yes, go ahead. So, you know, it, the Supreme Court said in this decision that, you know, the, the trademarks office said that it, it fears trademark protection, giving pro trademark protection for booking.com because it could exclude or inhibit competitors from using the term booking or adopting domain names like ebooking.com or hotel-booking.com. And the Supreme Court said, you know, that is a, is a common concern for descriptive marks that there's, there's always been this concern, but responsive to it, and I'm quoting, trademark law hems in, hems in, the scope of such marks short of denying trademark protection altogether. And so I, I think for domain investors and their counsel, they have to feel, they may have to push back strongly if they see overreach by trademark owners and, you know, citing that kind of position that says, listen, you got the most minor minuscule kind of trademark there is. It's hemmed in by justice, uh, uh, by the justice of the Supreme Court. And so that's all you get. Yeah, so I agree with that. that. Point, yeah. On that point, though, um, you know, un unfortunately, my fear with this case is that, you know, the average Joe domain investor, the guy who doesn't have deep pockets, doesn't want to spend tons of money fighting this. You get somebody that's overreaching. And, and, and as we discussed earlier, like the folks that are going to get these marks are going to be the biggest of the biggest because they're the ones that can get distinctiveness by spending billions of dollars you know, in marketing and advertising. So that guy comes and they're overreaching and, you know, it's, uh, you know, I've got, let's say ibooking.com and they come and knock on my door with a cease and desist letter or they just go straight to a UDRP. And, um, uh, you know, it's a clear overreach. Uh, what do I do? You know, like, so now I got to go spend a lot of money. To tra tra trademark law ain't fair. It ain't no, fair. Exactly. Uh, it ain't and fair. money, <laughs> so, money so matters. That's, my fear. that's, that's, my fear. that's yeah. a really discouraging takeaway. Well, uh, lie, lying fair, fair, period, uh, yeah. from one perspective, because the deep pockets uh, can really change outcomes, just, and if not outcomes, just outspending you to drag it out till you, you can't go anymore. And even, even with a simple demand letter. You know, you go, you go to even a reasonably priced attorney like uh, Karen or Steven to respond to a demand letter and it's going to cost some money. And, and, and so it takes money to protect yourself in this system. Right. Because you're the one who has to police it from the other side. It's your responsibility yeah, so owning a trademark. You know, what I actually think would be a great thing to do is to go to your client, Andrew, who has bookingcom.com 
And let's put no, up the exact. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, hey, actually, it might be. I have no idea. I actually don't know who. I thought everybody in the domain industry was your client. Come on. Well, probably, they probably are. They probably right. are. We could put yeah. up a, a, a site that does the exact same thing as Booking.com. Let's see if the, the Booking.com sends a cease and desist letter or a demand of some sort, and that'll be telling in and of itself. And then, you know, maybe we can just do that as a test case and see what actually happens. See what the Supreme Court says in that case, because that would be fascinating. Can I just- That's, called, want, that's what you I'm call poking the say, bear. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. I have one thing <laughs> Who's gonna be the registrant? A foreign Nevis corporation. Uh, hold on, you're, talk, you're talking over, you're talking over uh, uh, Karen here. Sorry, Karen, I, go ahead. I have one thing to say, and, and the elephant in the room is that bookingcom.com is using zero click, and it's redirecting to booking.com. They're probably oh, an affiliate, man. and they have a contract on with wow. each other. So it's probably yeah, okay. I don't know if they have a contract with each other, but they have a contract with someone to drive that traffic to their yes. website. And that's all I'm going to say on the subject. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Booking, so, Booking.com, yeah. if you're listening, uh, you just saw uh, an attorney you got to hire to uh, enforce your rights. <laughs> <laughs> they're making no, money anyway. Uh, they're not going to complain. Let, let, I, I want to, you know, shift, shift the conversation for one second, sort of. Um, one thing that sort of, uh, you know, that, that was fascinating to me in listening to some of the arguments um, was like how they talked about you know, dot com being a distinctive addition to a mark, right? So um, why is dot com being amended to the end of a word any different than I or E being amended to the start of a word? Why, why is that any different? Like why is iPhone a very powerful mark, but phone.com probably can't get a trademark for selling phones? Right. Or, or, you know, uh, producing a phone. You've um, actually answered this question yourself, Andrew, a number of times. And if you, I've even heard you do a sales call saying something about this. Specifically, what you've said in the past is when you go to a domain name, it is the only domain name that is that exact domain. So mm -hmm. if you, someone is typing in booking.com, that's where they're ending up. If someone puts in ibooking.com, they're going to a different website. There's a different mm -hmm. DNS. It is an exclusive. It's just like land, real property, in that there is no other, no matter what, when it comes to it. As is, isn't that outside the scope of a trademark, right? Because the, now you're talking about the logistics of what a domain name is versus a mark, which is, you mm. know, static, right? You're saying it's the static mark. Uh, which can be used not just as a domain name, but booking.com isn't just, you know, its protection isn't just for a domain name. It would be in any type of commerce or any type of marketing. And so um, uh, I, I still don't, as, as a mark, I don't, I still don't. I, I the Supreme Court specifically said, let's look at these things from the point of view of the consuming public. And mm -hmm. there is, the consuming public at this point in the universe, as opposed to 20 years ago, understands mm -hmm. that one domain name is an exclusive thing, that you mm -hmm. can't go anywhere else because of it. And I think that was somewhat in the back of the minds of the Supreme Court because that, they, I mean, yes, they're not getting anything more. I don't think they can really go after other people per se, but and I think the Supreme Court was sort of thinking about that, that, you know, the consuming public knows that when you're going to booking.com, you're only going to booking.com. You can't, it's not like you're going to a particular town and there's 12 different stores there. There's only one store here. And so there's only one way for somebody to think about booking.com and that's of this particular company. That's not so really let's enjoy, let's I didn't read it that way. I, I think that, the dot com, it's that they've been using it and that consumers perceive, they perceive the trademark as a source. And trademarks are about source identification. You think McDonald's, you know, automatically it's burgers. You think Starbucks, you automatically know it's coffee. 
what the survey evidence that convinced them, which was presented in the lower court in your hometown district kind of area in Virginia, said that 79% of the respondents perceived booking.com as the source of the trade uh, of for booking services. So it's consumer per perception, right? I mean, that's okay. really what it's about. But well, why so, did they, yeah. why did the consumer perceive it that way? Well, I would have to look at the survey. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, it, Andrew, like in, in, do they know? <laughs> So back in 1998 or 1999, I think it was, the USPTO came out with an advisory that, that set out that .com means commercial, .net yeah. means network, .org means .organization, and for the purposes of examination of trademarks for reviewing the applications, these things are ignored because they, they're just descriptive terms, and, and that's been the policy, uh, you know, since right. forever but but over but over time i think uh, the you know the public started identifying uh dot com is not meaning commercial per se in their mind yeah. oh it's booking dot commercial you know or you know it, it started becoming part of the brand through promotion they just think of booking dot com they don't think of what dot com means in this context they don't think of what booking means i think you know booking dot com is the brand and so i think that's what the court really you know identified is that these days after 20 plus years of the explosion of the commercial internet, the dot .com isn't like dot .inc or dot .ll, uh, dot .lc or dot, uh, dot .limited. It's not like having wine company or wine limited, uh, which you can't get a trademark over because, because uh, there could be many different companies all over the states called uh, you know wine com uh, wine company limited, et cetera. Whereas with trademarks, you can only, only have one. So I think the Supreme Court, made the right call on this. They said, listen, we've seen, we've seen the evolution of the commercial internet. We, we now know that consumers are able, uh, in certain situations, they spend a lot of money in spending, to identify uh, a generic dot com with a particular company. Mm -hmm. What about the, you, you brought up an interesting point. So what about if I now create a company called booking.com LLC, uh, but I don't even own booking.com, the domain name, but my company, there's nothing preventing me from calling my company booking.com LLC or, you know, uh, you know, apple.com, uh, uh, limited, um, assuming I can find a jurisdiction there where, you know, where that company name isn't already registered. I, I could, you know, presumptively, uh, register that company name and, and be called booking.com LLC. I start conducting commerce, uh, can I now fight booking.com and their trade? Well, well mean, first I... of all, you're, 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 you're making the assumption that setting up a corporation actually means something. The only thing it means is that you get to be taxed. Um, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. But uh, I, I'm engaged in commerce, all right? So, so okay. just, but separate the right two, now. separate the two. Okay. They're very, it's very important to separate the two. You're setting well, up a company. Yes, not really. You're setting right? up I mean, a company is not tra a trademark use. Okay. It is. But if I, it's a I trade a name, company, and a I've trade name and a trademark are not the same thing whatsoever. It's well, your use of that mark in commerce, specifically associated with your goods and services, that actually makes it into a trademark. Okay, but let's say I start Booking.com LLC, and I am now, you know, doing bookbinding or you know, whatever it is that I'm doing. You can um, actually go. Look, I, I see nothing wrong. Remember, no, no entity has a right and a right and gross to a mark unless they're litigated, per, uh, famous. So yeah, okay. go ahead, set up Booking.com, and and do book finding. It's a di sufficiently different goods and services. I don't think there's any possibility of confusion. Okay, so but do I, you know, I, I, I'm leading you in this question. So <laughs> what I ultimately intend here is that. What's stopping somebody from utilizing the logic of this decision to then set up companies? Uh, you know, somebody like Michael Gleitner, Gle uh, Gleisner, Gleitner, uh, the Bigfoot guy. Gle yeah. So, you know, he goes out, he starts registering companies, conducting commerce, establishes trademarks for, you know, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, let's stick with booking.com. So he's got booking.com you know, set up in whatever, Malta, Cyprus, whatever weird jurisdictions, he's able to get the trademark, set up the company. 
and uh, let's just say that booking.com isn't some huge corporation, can he now come after me for if I own booking.com? Let, let, let's see. Because it gets too confusing with booking.com because everybody already knows, as the surveys have shown, that booking.com is, is a mark and is a company. Let's say, you know, a domain we own, um, uh, uh, I, I don't know, let's say, uh, I don't know, Pegasus.com. Okay, so Pegasus.com. So he goes and he sets up Pegasus.com LLC and he starts conducting commerce in whatever field. And, uh, you know, he, let's say that I have a park page on it, which we don't. But, uh, you know, what it, it is forwarding to the media options domain brokerage page. So now he goes, sets up Pegasus.com LLC, he's, you know, in, in the field of domain brokerage. And so he starts brokering domain names under Pegasus.com LLC. You know, it's on his marketing, it's on his advertising, it's on his invoices. He gets a trademark and he files UDRP against Pegasus.com. Well, I we mean, had the exact, we had essentially that exact same case. And, and, and the reality is, is domain names and trademarks are not the same thing. Domain names can be not used and therefore they're actually a fungible good. And mm -hmm. UDRP would not, would not be won on that basis um, under, under any circumstances. Um, on the other hand, if you're using it in commerce, let's say you're, you're pointing it to a landing page where you're making PPC income, that has been adjudged to be trademark usage. And as such, therefore, the person who had the domain name first prior to the person setting up their business and using it in commerce would therefore be the senior user. And therefore, that again, the person with the domain name would win. All true. Yeah. So I've got a, a, a slightly different answer to that uh, as well, in, in addition to, to Stephen's correct answers, that, that it really, if someone had set up the Pegasus LLC company and wanted to get your Pegasus.com domain name, uh, they would still need to prove if it was UDRP bad faith registration. You registered it to target them, and you probably didn't, right? So, no. so th therefore, you would succeed in a UDRP context. The, the, se the second thought about that is that there is an issue that has, has been ongoing for the last 20 plus years with trademarks and domain names, and that's that. If you're sitting on Pegasus.com and you're not using it at all, not PPC, just not at all, and, and someone starts, uh, um, creates a business, a real business called Pegasus for Pegasus beer, all right? Uh, you, he, can't, he or she can't take away your domain name just because of that, but the value of your domain name may be depreciated because it can no longer be used for beer. Pegasus.com can't be used for beer, right? So the yes. scope of your possible purchasers narrows every time someone gets a, uh, 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 a trademark. You know, it's interesting because I, I, I hear that argument from, uh, you know, attorneys and, and particularly corporate attorneys when they're trying to tell me that the value of the domain is not what I think it is because if they don't buy it, nobody will. Uh, I, I would argue differently. I mean, I think that, you know, what, what was really interesting to me in, in, the decision language was how much they touted, you know, it was almost like a revelation from, from, I, I think there was two, two of the justices, you know, that it was almost revelation, revelationary for them that it was like, Oh my God, these domain names are unbelievably valuable because <laughs> yeah. they're granting you a monopoly on the internet for a keyword. Now, wait a, uh, now, now wait a minute. And that's, that is impressive that they realize that, but setting that aside, we all, well, I mean, we all have had clients or we have investments. I'm not saying anything in specifically in generic.coms. And you know, you've got to have a stomach because there's always somebody around the corner who's going to try and sue you because they want that. But donor. that's in every, you want to make, you want to be successful in any business on the face of planet earth today. But if you're you better have a stomach for it because if, if, if you show, if you're successful, I somebody's agree. done it for you every time. Doesn't that's matter what field thing. you're in. I have clients who don't have a stomach for it, so it makes it very difficult. But the point exactly. of the matter is that when a domain name is sitting there, it's a generic domain name, it hasn't been used in 10 years, it's a lot harder to sell that domain name. But on the other hand, you're going to have- I would argue again, different. differently. Uh, my experience is different. My experience is different. I actually, I mean, you know, it depends on, everything is very subjective when it comes but, to these things. But Gabriel, who always said, all we do, it, we sell air. Okay, because I brokered. Ah, that's why Jeff Gabriel's number two at best. 
No, I love you, Jeff. Uh, listen, we are not selling air. I think that we're selling one of the most valuable assets on the face of planet Earth today. And I think that they are so undervalued in the marketplace. And I think that this court decision uh, is going to be a catalyst for the broader market understanding the value of these things. And, and that's sort of what I've been trying to lead up to here in this conversation is that, you know, ultimately somebody that hasn't been using the domain for the last 10 years, well, my argument is, and this is because I'm a salesperson, is, well, now you've got a clean slate, right? Because like, I've got a lot of people that come in and say, well, you know, I'm not sure about the use. Somebody's been using this domain for, you know, party supplies and I'm going to use it to sell cars. And so, I, you know, I'm not sure, you know, there's going to create confusion, right? Uh, clean slate from an SEO perspective, from a branding perspective, it's what you want. You want a clean slate. So, um, so I think that that's uh, a value add. Uh, you know, it's a feature, not a flaw. Um, but I think that in terms of you know uh, assessing further value to a .com domain name as as a result of this decision, um, you know, I think uh, it provides hope, right? So, so. Again, just coming back to what I said at the very beginning of this conversation, when I'm talking to you know, a corporate attorney or to a you know, chief marketing officer or whoever it is making a decision about a six and seven figure domain name, these folks are, their primary concern is less about the money and more about, am I going, we just lost, we sold stretch.com uh, and way undersold it. Uh, and, and it should have sold for a lot more. Um, uh, uh, I guess that's a redundant statement. Uh, it, and the reason is that we had a buyer at $500,000. Uh, they came in, they were ready to do the deal. It went to escrow. The attorney killed the deal because he said, look, we're not going to be able to get a trademark. Um, you know, I think they wanted to use it for like, um, actually like stretching studios. Okay. Um, which is a thing. So um, uh, like a Pilates studio. Right. And so he killed the deal and, you know, with the booking.com decision, I could have said, well, actually, uh, if you can establish yourself as stretch.com, the place to come, you know, to do stretching, you can get rights. You have hope. There is a window now. We, there is now a window that you can go through if you can establish yourself as distinctive. And, and, and that is really key. Now, one thing that I think is important to um, highlight is that this what, I, what I'm talking about here, this, 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 this window, this, this, this additional value is not going to apply to smaller domains. It's not going to have the same effect on, you know, uh, your average two word, three word, you know, dot net, uh, dot org, dot whatever. Um, because the, just by the nature of, of how this all works, for the most part, the folks that are going to buy that name don't have the pockets to create distinctiveness. So it really is this, in my mind, please correct me if I'm wrong, but in my mind, the benefit of this case only really applies to, you know, super premium category killer, generic, uh, you know, could be one, two, three word, doesn't matter, but category killer, category defining, could be car insurance quotes, right? Or it could be cars.com, right? But um, really high value domains where somebody's going to come in and build a really high value company on top, spend the money to get the distinctiveness. Because without any of that, none of this really matters. Is that a fair assessment? Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, if you have a lot of money, it's a lot easier to get that sort of stuff to happen. I mean, even from the point of view of social media, you go to the social media people, you pay a lot of people to drive traffic and, and, and to retweet or share or something, whatever the hell that is, um, that takes money because um, you're paying employees to do stuff. Um, so overall, you're right. I'm sure there's going to be instances where that's not true, but I think they're going to be few and far between, unfortunately. I think that it's an absolutely great tool for brokers and people selling domain names to say to companies, this is a category killer.com. You have the money, you can develop this. Now we all know that at least the one- And now that, you've got a true moat around you have, your business, right? Like, can you, I can't imagine a better moat around any business it, that you and I- Having the trademark and the distinctive.com 
you know, generic category killer. Like, yeah, but how the, do you create a better the mode? Obstacle, the obstacle has always been, oh, now we've got to build a whole marketing campaign around this domain name if we want to buy it. Now what you can say is, guess what? You can, and you can get yeah. maybe a trademark on it. You so can generate is, residual value yeah. on that marketing campaign. Yes. yes. I mean, it's, I don't think it's going to be that great a moat uh, from the trademark point of view. I think it is going to add value to the larger companies because of that capability. Um, and higher valuations matter, especially to public companies. Yeah. Um, so from that point of view, it matters. I think it's going to matter enormously for you, Andrew, that you're going to be, have another tool in your uh, toolbox in order to get people to buy domain names. Um, and mm -hmm. I think you'll be able to get higher, higher amounts for those domain names because of it, I think. So I think it helps the domain industry on the high end a lot. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's going to help the low end, frankly, at all. Um, yeah. And I wonder what's going to happen when you, people start applying for trademarks here in the U.S. and then they're, they're able to get them here and they're not able to get them in other parts of the, country, other parts of the world. Because now we have different standards um, depending upon your jurisdiction. And you, it used to be the standards were much closer. And I think the standards are started sort of drifting apart a little bit. But that could be an entirely different discussion in this one. So I, I, I want to wrap it, you know, do a little like lightning round here at the end with um, sort of what are the benefits to domain investors? What are the risks to domain, domain investors? Um, and sort of just get all your opinions. But I want to make one comment before that. Um, I don't remember what the, the attorney's name was, Karen, but you, you mentioned, uh, and I think Zach mentioned it too, uh, uh, one of the attorneys um, who said he didn't think that there would be a, a, you know, a wave of trademark filings and uh, UDRPs. I disagree. I've had two clients, you know, we're, we, we're, we're a boutique business. Like we only broker, I don't know, Tess, what do we got? 10, 20 domains right now for brokers max. Um, and so uh, of those, let's say 10, 12 that we got, two people um, reached out to me and said, hey, read about this booking.com case. Do you think I should go apply for a trademark for my generic.com? And, uh, and I said, no, I don't think you should because you know, you're not even using it. What are you going to apply for a trademark for, right? But that's not the point. The point is in the mind of the average Joe, and these are not average Joes. These are you know, one guy is uh, one of the largest debt restructuring uh, uh, superman, you know, of, of the world, uh, billionaire. Uh, the other guy is, uh, a, a, you know, very successful uh, uh, executive, business executive. Uh, these are very intelligent people. These are the people that represent these types of companies who will then subsequently read these articles and decision and say, oh, let's go file a trademark, right? So I, as a non-attorney, as a domain broker, representing 10, 12 domain names, two of those people reached out to me almost immediately after this case came down, after this ruling came down and said, hey, should I now, uh, you know, in various forms, but basically, should I go out and, and file a trademark now for this domain name to increase its value? Um, so my answer to it is not important. My, that what's important is, is the perception in the general public is that, oh wow, now there is this new window for everybody who's got a generic.com to come out and file a trademark. And then probably in the same vein, they'll say, okay, now I'm gonna go out and, you know, I'm gonna get that domain squatter and try and file a bunch of ERPs that are unfortunately gonna hurt, you know, domain investors in, in my mind, just because they're gonna have to spend senseless money to defend their rights. Um, so, that is, that's been my experience over the course of the last, whatever it is, two, three weeks since that decision came down. Um, Andrew, um, two, I'm going to make two comments and then I have to run because I've got a hearing to go to. Um, one, I agree uh, because I've had that happen to me as well. I had one client that wants, that's actually, we're going to be filing a, a mark uh, on a generic.com. And another client who has uh, came and said, you know, do we really want, maybe we should just file 8,000 trademarks. And I said, you're crazy. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Um, and you don't understand the ruling whatsoever. Um, so I, I dissuaded him from going in that direction, even though it would have been a lot of money for us. So, but yeah, the, I mean, the majority, gonna... the majority, unfortunately, the majority of, of, of attorneys, in my experience, uh, and I forgive you guys, but, um, uh, you know, they're readily happy to take your money and file that, you know, trademark. 
readily, happily to take your money and file that UDRP. I mean, in the number of bad UDRP cases that get filed, you can see how many, you know, let's say unscrupulous uh, uh, IP attorneys there are who are readily happy to take their client's money to file a frivolous UDRP, file a frivolous Attorneys trademark. are not supposed to let cases move forward that have no merit. And that's including trademark filings, including UDRPs, including court cases. What sure. people do in reality and what people think are frivolous <laughs> and isn't is an entirely different story and yet another discussion. Um, yes. But yes, I think you're right. I don't think the consuming public don't really understand what this means. And I think it, only time will tell as to find out what it really means. Um, so that being said, yeah. Thank you for well, sure. so so thank you. share your insight. Question. Right. I got to go, guys. It's good okay. talking to you. Uh, before you guys run. Uh, uh, okay. Bye, Stephen. Bye, Stephen. Really quick. Uh, just for the summa, because you know some of this was probably um, uh, went over the head of some of our audience. Really quick, assuming that the audience is 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 you know your average Joe domain investor. Um, what are you know sort of bullet point format? What are the benefits to your average Joe domain investor, if any, and what are the risks to the average Joe domain investor, if any? Karen. All right, so let's see. Let's do the benefits. So the benefit is that if you happen to be lucky enough to have acquired something that seems, it could be a two word generic dot com. You know, let's see, like, uh, I don't know, carwash.com. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carwash.com. And you've been using it for a long time. And you got some investors. You could get more investors. That's the that's the what I think would be for the average person to say, I own carwash.com and I want to raise money to build this site. No, nah, but that's it. getting outside the scope. We're talking about, you know, buy and hold domain investors. I bought well, a domain on dropcatch.com, I bought a domain on GoDaddy. Yeah, well, you know, I bought a domain from sale. somebody that hasn't used it in 10 years. All yeah. I'm doing is buying a domain, sticking yeah. it in my inventory. Maybe I'm parking it, maybe I'm not. Yep. Um, yeah. Any benefit or any risk to me as, you know, I, I, I you know, drop, let's say carwash.com expired on GoDaddy. I bought it. I paid, you know, hundred grand. I've got carwash.com now. It's in my inventory. Anything I need to be thinking about here because of this case, good, um, bad, or otherwise? I would definitely think that you could, A, try to sell it to, to a company that isn't using that term. Um and use the benefit of what we discussed before is that it's an additional tool to go to a company and say, I want you to buy it because I think this is a great domain name that you can build a real brand out of. And in fact, not only the brand, but due to the booking.com case, you might be able to get trade federal trademarks on it. It will add value to your company. You will add value to your company. So that's the positive. The negative is that you might be setting yourself up for a lawsuit because there are a lot of big companies out there that are looking for generic.coms now to build on, to get trademark rights on. So it's kind of scary and it's kind of good at the same time. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to take chances. And if you really wanted to avoid having an overreaching company trying to steal a domain name like carwash.com from you through a UDRP or a lawsuit, you might want to make it about something completely different, having nothing to do with car washes. Mm -hmm. But I will say, and I'm not saying to use me, it's always good to go to a trademark attorney and have them do a trademark search to find out what kind of ways you can use that website on the domain name so that you can avoid getting sued. Because there are others out there who might use the term car wash for something other than car washes. Mm -hmm. So stick to, if I were to surmise that, I would say stick to, if you're going to use the domain in commerce in any way, whether that's PPC or putting up a website, stick to its generic meaning in order to avoid any of those conflicts of people that use that term in another way. Is that a correct assessment? Yes, no. I would say that not necessarily sticking to the generic is that you make sure that what you're, how you're using the site isn't infringing on someone else's rights. That if you are using it generically, you could still get snubbed 
unfortunately, by uh, a big company coming out of the woodwork. However, you're better off on a defensible point of view using the site for something having nothing to do with car washes, provided that you have a way through a professional, a trademark professional, and make sure that you're not using it for something like, I don't know, entertainment services. Because, you know, I know there was a movie years ago called Car Wash, so. Yeah. Zach? Yeah. So uh, my takeaway from the booking.com decision is it didn't change the law and it didn't change the domain name business but it changed perception in two ways, one good, one bad. The way it changed perception in a good way is that uh, companies may now perceive based upon the attention uh, that the booking.com case got that their generic.com may have more value because there's a clear hope that it could become a registered trademark. That's a good, mm -hmm. good uh, change of perception. Mm -hmm. The bad change of perception is that some people, whether it be uh, legal departments and companies, marketing managers, uh, IP attorneys may misunderstand the implications of the decision and try to misuse it uh, to overreach, whether it be UDRP or in the trademark context. Uh, so th that's my takeaway. Great, great. So, uh, you know, as a domain investor and a domain broker, I, I, you know, really appreciate this conversation because it's helped, you know, clarify what I think has been a very confusing thing in the domain industry. Um, both among domain, you know, domainers uh, uh, of whatever, you know, uh, type, uh, as well as the attorneys. I mean, there's been some some uh, lively discussion among some of the, the attorneys on Twitter. So um, I, I think uh, this has been really helpful in sussing that out. And I appreciate, uh, you know, all of you uh, helping do so. Um, where can everybody uh, uh, find you uh, as they need to start defending their uh, domain names against privileged UDRPs that are going to come in a tidal wave? Well, you know, look me up. Cage, you know, Bernstein IP, B E R N S T E I N I P dot com. Great. Have that trademarked? <laughs> Cool. And Zach, how about you? Yeah. So uh, if you need a good attorney for UDRP or IP, please uh, go to go to Karen or, or Stephen. If you need, if you are interested in uh, UDRP and ICANN and domain name policy, please go to internetcommerce.org. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your time. Um, I look forward to next time you're on. Drew, you did my job hey. today. Thank you. <laughs> well, I just want to make one more quick comment. Uh, and that is about the ICA um, that uh, the IPA, uh, Zach and um, uh, 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 was it David Wyland who, who, who yeah, helped uh, write the amicus? David Westlow. Westlow, yeah. Uh, 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 on behalf of the ICA, um, submitted a, a very important brief that I think was, you know, potentially influential in the. Um, in the, the Supreme Court's decision, or in part, perhaps. And um, it's for things like that that we all do support the ICA. And if you do not support the ICA, you should. And so please visit internetcommerce.org and uh, uh, you know make a determination about whether or not you should be supporting it. But if you are a domain owner, I don't think that there's much question. And uh, the ICA has expanded its uh, ability, uh, against my opinion, but uh, ability to participate, uh, starting with, I think, just a, 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 an annual contribution of something like 50 bucks. Uh, is that right, yeah. Zach? You can even buy me a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, thank you uh, to the ICA for helping support your main investors. Thank you to you guys for coming on the show. Thanks. Right. Thank, thank you guys. so much, Tess. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks, Karen. That was wonderful. Thank you, and be safe and be well, everybody. Thank you. All right, see y'all next time. Bye.